When I was entering the Pomona College, I found something inscripted on the wall that says, let only the eager, thoughtful and reverent end here. Um, well, I'm not sure whether I really fulfill these requirements, <laughs> but I'm still happy that I was given the chance by Tom Flaherty to be here and share uh, some of my ideas and my music. Um, this lecture today is not a lecture in the normal sense, but I will give you a lot of thoughtful thinkings and wisdoms. Um, I would like to give you some insights in the working process of a piece or a series of pieces that I've been doing uh, within the last uh, years. It's called Sekitur and it contains a cycle of 14 uh, different uh, compositions for a solo instrument with live electronics. Um, this was a, for me, I think, a, a premiere that in one festival five pieces of this cycle have been performed. Um, and that's the reason why I would like to talk more about these um, ideas, how it came to this. Um, you all know uh, probably the, the works of Luciano Berio. Uh, he has written in the 60s and 70s and until the early 80s a cycle of solo compositions for solo instruments called um, Sequenza or in the plural Sequenze. Um, here he tries to uh, write pieces that would embrace all everything that's possible for a solo instrument. So there's a wonderful piece for, for voice, maybe you have sung it once. <laughs> it's, a, it's an incredible complicated thing that was written originally for Katie Barbarian and he has um, always had a, a special soloist in mind and was writing this piece for him or her. And um, in 2008, I was thinking uh, myself about making a sort of succession of this project of Berio, now with uh, solo instruments or solo voice and electronics. And the idea was that the electronics are entirely uh, generated by the um, input of the instrument or the voice and that it would not require uh, a second musician uh, to perform these pieces. This was a hypothesis. In practice it turned out that uh, several of those pieces are impossible to be played alone. For example, the piano piece that we heard yesterday, there's so much interaction with the electronics that the poor pianist who has to um, hassle with all those strings to, to go and, and prepare keys to hit that she would be completely um, overwhelmed by using two pedals to control our things. So that's the reason why some of those pieces are, are require two musicians. But in general, the idea is that a musician can come on stage just uh, having a laptop, a microphone, my software that I developed for those pieces and the score and just take off and play. Uh, as I'm here, and as the um, time for rehearsing was not uh, so long, uh, I offered the possibility that I do this electronics. But the piece that, especially today, is played on the toy piano, is really not necessary that I stand there and make the cues, so this can be easily done by the musician. Um, uh, Berio's Sequenze has a, uh, a number of 14 different pieces and I also have 14 pieces. At a certain point <coughs> I had to finish. I, I got a lot of demands writing other and more and more and more but I thought after 14 pieces I would be happy to close this project. <coughs> At the moment, um, or yesterday we heard two uh, secretary pieces that are for very traditional instruments like a cello and a piano but today we, have, we are more on the fun side so we have a toy piano, electric guitar and a kalimba uh, which is this African thumb piano which is played so nicely by Tony Perlman. Um, the instruments that I'm using in this series, in this cycle are uh, spanning a whole range of different orchestral instruments. Uh, the first piece I did was a flute piece 
which was sort of improvisation. So I just jotted down in one night a few musical motifs which are uh, embedded in a certain harmonic structure and had the idea that another musician would just improvise with the electronics and play along with the piece. Then it became more and more focused and the last pieces that I wrote in the, in the last two years are very, very uh, uh, precise in, in terms of timing and, and, and experimental flow. So this has also changed a bit uh, through the project. Um, the live electronics are based on uh, an idea that is a very, very old composition and uh, principle that was also used in the, in the Middle Ages, in the medieval music, and mainly in the franco flamian music of the uh, 14th and 13th century, 14th and 15th century, the principle of a canon. The idea of a canon uh, is that um, in, if you take this literally, canon means uh, a law, a rule, an algorithm, and the algorithm uh, at this time was uh, take, a melody, take a melody and use it in a different way, maybe on a, on a different time spot, in a different transposition, in a in an, uh, compressed or expanded time scale, and giving uh, a melody and the algorithm that means the description of what to do with the melody, uh, a lot of composers have been constructed very, very beautiful pieces. And this also applies to the Sekve tool. So there is always um, an input of a solo instrument or a solo voice, and the computer program that I have been written in Max MSP, in this software that Tom already mentioned, uh, first makes a sort of a canon, a, a nine-part canon, so it adds eight more voices to the input, and by this uh, the instrument is, so to, so to speak, embedded into itself. Sometimes it appears like a mirror, uh, house of mirrors, where you get in and you see a lot of different uh, facets of, uh, of the same thing, but in different focuses and angles. And this um, canon is, uh, in, in a way, uh, not uh, a not normal and ordinary canon, as we know it uh, maybe from folk music. Um, the time structure of the canon is uh, constructed in a way that the entry delays between the canon uh, entrances is not constant. So it fo follows a certain uh, function so that in the beginning it's, it's uh, the long entry delays, they become shorter and shorter and at the end they become long, long again. So that in fact you create a sort of wave function which would guarantee that the canon layers uh, would never be on the same spot together. So it is very important to break this uh, very simplistic system of a canon and make it more fluid. And then as a second principle, that those eight uh, generated, live generated canon uh, voices are not always being played. There is a hidden uh, conductor inside the program who gives cues to the different canons and uh, turns them on, turns them off. And these cues are given, uh, are not given by a certain uh, predictable function, but are using random operations, so that the result that comes out is in a way always a little bit unpredictable. Uh, this gives the musician, if he plays the piece, uh, a, a possibility to be much more creative and open, uh, because he is not following uh, a given form that is always the same, but he has the freedom of uh, listening at some points. There are formatos in the piece where you can just listen and wait for the, what the canon is doing, and then you can decide when to move to the next step. So this gives the, uh, the instrumentalist, the interpreter, uh, another um, responsibility that is more than he's normally having if he just plays along with the tape piece where you have to follow very strictly the given time. 